Hello, attendees. Attendees, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I, I know people are still working on their, their, their lunches, desserts, drinking coffee, but in, as we do that, um, we'd like to, I'd like to get the next part of the program going. Um, I want to introduce uh, Congressman Goodlad, who will introduce our, our lunch and discussant today. Uh, Congressman Bob Goodlad needs no introduction. He's the chairman of the Congressional Internet Caucus. He's also the chair of the uh, subcommittee on intellectual property, competition, and the internet. And if I can just welcome Congressman Goodlad to the podium and Mr. Westergren as well. Tim, thank you very much, and thanks for the great job that you and the others on the staff of the Congressional Internet uh, uh, Advisory Foundation do to promote the Internet and uh, all of those who uh, have their livelihood or uh, their uh, enjoyment or their business operations dependent upon the great success of the Internet. Uh, with apologies uh, to uh, Pandora, I want to take two minutes to talk about uh, a subject that I randomly selected that has some small interest to people here today, and that is the Stop Online Piracy Act. And I just want to uh, uh, say a couple of things about it, and then we'll get right to this. But since it is uh, obviously on everybody's mind, I want to uh, uh, tell you that over the past few months, I've spoken on numerous occasions with technology experts and engineers about the issue of online theft, and I've explored their recommendations regarding alternative ways to attack the problem. I'm convinced that the tech industry has additional contributions to make in the effort to create tools to better combat online theft, making sure that our First Amendment freedoms are protected and the Internet is not harmed. In fact, in a joint letter to Congress recently, many prominent internet companies signed on to this letter regarding SOPA, stating, quote, we support the bill's stated goals, providing additional enforcement tools to combat foreign rogue websites that are dedicated to copyright infringement and counterfeiting. We should take a full opportunity to bring tech industry leaders and engineers together with those representing the myriad of businesses that are suffering substantial theft and fraud due to illegal actions of foreign criminals so that new ideas can be put on the table with careful examination about how the tech sector can work with affected partners to help fight this scourge. The technology and content communities and others doing business on the internet need each other. The technology community needs creative new content to continue to push consumer demand for innovative tech products. The content community needs the innovative technology community to continue to find ways to deliver new content to consumers. Any successful legislative product will have to have some level of buy-in from both communities. We can all agree about the importance of protecting American innovation from foreign thieves. And so I think it is critical that key parties have a seat at the table and I will work to facilitate this kind of direct face-to-face -face discussion between the various interested parties. Thank you, and we'll get on with the show. Tim, welcome. Thank you. We're delighted to have you with us. Tim is the Chief Strategy Officer and founder of Pandora Media. Uh, he founded Pandora in January of 2000 and now serves as its chief strategy officer. Tim is an award-winning composer, an accomplished musician, and a record producer with 20 years of experience in the music industry. He has recorded with independent labels, managed artists, owned a commercial digital recording studio, scored feature films, produced albums, and performed extensively. His main instrument is the piano, but over the years he's played the bassoon, drums, and clarinet, and his musical background spans such genres as rock, blues, jazz, and classical music. He has a BA from Stanford University where he studied computer acoustics and recording technology. A musician's musician, he is obsessed with helping talented emerging artists connect with the music fans most likely to appreciate their music. 
In addition to guiding Pandora's overall strategy and vision, Tim now spends most of his time as Pandora's chief evangelist, traveling the country to meet with listeners to collect feedback, research local music, and spread the word of the Music Genome Project. Let's welcome Tim Westergren. Tim, I'm a, a user and fan of Pandora myself. Fantastic. I think it's great technology. I think it's exactly what uh, uh, we're talking about when we try to find that common ground between the use of technology and the, the great content that's available on the internet. So my congratulations to you uh, for that. And uh, I'll turn it over to you to say a few words. And I've got a few questions for you, and I'm sure some other folks do as well. Sure. Well, actually, maybe I'm just curious. How many people here in this room have actually used Pandora? Nice. Home, home, t home ground. Actually, it's interesting, uh, if I had asked that question a year ago, which I did when I was here, how different the, the uh, answer was, and I think it just reflects the growth of the, of the service. So um, I guess you were a bit on my background. I, I founded this company back in 2000, which was probably the most unimaginably off worst time to launch a technology company. Uh, in March of 2000, right before uh, everything collapsed, the first technology bust. Uh, we spent about uh, four years uh, essentially just surviving, um, having this kernel of an idea, which was the Music Genome Project. And, and the core of the genome is, is this enormous musical taxonomy. So it's, it's, a, it's a massive hand-built database. It's been built by musicians, uh, a team that has been as large as 50, um, who have spent every day coming into Pandora's offices and listening to individual recordings and analyzing them along as many as 450 musical attributes per song, manually scoring them, essentially capturing the equivalent of musical DNA. Uh, the idea being that that could form the basis for helping people discover artists. And, and in particular, starting with an artist they know, finding an artist they would, have a heart, they would otherwise never be able to find that this genome would be the, the perfect sort of mechanism for surfacing a lot of unknown music. And, and so we worked on that, that uh, project for uh, almost five years um, before we actually became Pandora, the internet radio company. Um, for about half of those five years, the team of people actually didn't take salary. Um, we called that salary deferral at, at the time. That was our management term for it. Turns out that's illegal in California. Um, <laughs> statues behind us, though. Um, and uh, uh, we wound up, though, in 2005 with this, this enormous uh, collection of analyzed material and decided to launch the, the, the web service, which we did in November of 2005. And, and it just took off like a rocket ship. Uh, we, have, we recently announced that we have 125 million uh, registered listeners on Pandora. And technology has really transformed our world. It's, it's allowed us to deliver this service not just through desktop and laptop computers, but now on mobile phones, on consumer electronics devices, and increasingly uh, into cars uh, via smartphones, but with really nice uh, sort of embedded implementations. And, and so we're sort of, I think, at the dawn of a really interesting new era for radio. And, and, and I, one, one, I, one, I think, dimension of this that is obviously near and dear to me uh, that I think is really important is uh, there are, I think, two uh, uh, dimensions of internet radio that are particularly important to understand. One is it can accommodate a much broader catalog of music. So we have the music of over 90,000 artists on Pandora, uh, about over 900,000 songs, and nine, over 95% of those songs play every month on Pandora. So. It's an enormous change from a medium radio that has traditionally played from a much more narrow catalog, you know, three or 400 songs at a time, now drawing from this huge breadth of music, uh, the vast majority of which has never had the opportunity to be played on radio. So I think it's got all sorts of potential for musicians. The second thing is we pay performers, uh, which is not true of broadcast radio. So when an artist's music spins on Pandora, we pay a royalty, which is actually administered through a piece of federal legislation called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and, and that money is collected and distributed out to artists. And I would actually argue that the most significant economic uh, uh, opportunity 
that digital music offers the music industry is the migration of radio from a mode where performers are not compensated to one where they are. And uh, radio has historically been the largest piece of the pie in the music industry, and musicians have never participated in it. it, it composers have, but not performers. And now they're going to get to. So I think it's a really uh, bright spot uh, in, in sort of the future of the industry, and I, and I also like to think that we're helping consumers along the way get reconnected to music. So that's kind of our little story for us right now. It's a great story. And mm -hmm. you have a number on how many users you have at this point? So we, we, we have over 125 million registered users, and that, that, that shakes out to, to be a little north of 45 million per month. And that's all in the U.S. We're only licensed to play in the U.S. What would you say are some of the biggest challenges that you face and uh, that is faced in general in the digital music services environment? Well, for us, there's one sort of very simple issue, which is the royalty burden that we bear. We are fans of paying performers, but we're in a situation where we pay a, a vastly disproportionate amount of royalties as compared to other, other forms of radio. So just by comparison, last year we paid in the neighborhood of 50% of our gross revenue uh, in performance royalties. Uh, by comparison, uh, cable satellite paid about 7.5%. And I, as I mentioned before, broadcast radio paid zero. And increasingly, as technology brings internet connectivity everywhere and internet radio everywhere, we have this very odd situation where you, you could be in a car listening to radio and it might be Pandora, which you may be streaming you know, through your iPhone or Android through your dashboard, or XM Sirius or AM FM. And even though to the consumer it looks and feels just like radio, it's playing through your speakers and you really don't know the difference, except Pandora's playing music you like. Um, and, and yet, depending on the mode, the artist is either getting nothing, 7.5% of revenue, or 50% of revenue. So I think it's a, it's a classic example of where technology and the law or legislation are kind of you know, out of sync. So I, that, that is by far our largest issue. We do need to achieve greater fairness in that area, no question about it. What exciting new business models do you see for the future of online music? Well, it won't be surprised to say I think radio is a, a really good one, but I think that um, one of the uh, great promises of uh, connected radio, so two-way, as you know on Pandora, you can use thumbs to curate your station and refine it. You can have a conversation. It, it's a two-way dialogue. And we have a pretty good idea now on Pandora about what kind of music people like and where they are in the country, because you provide a, a zip code when you register. And we have the ability to communicate with you, either through email or through the, the, um, the actual service as you listen. So the potential is there to, I think, do all sorts of really interesting things to nurture the sort of musician's uh, environment. Uh, I was a musician myself, or I lived out of a van for a long time, and you know, for us, the, the, our idea of cost-effective marketing was to drive 2,000 miles to Colorado and show up in town and put flyers up on telephone poles for about an hour before our show and hope that we'd get people to come and then drive 2,000 miles back and do that again six months later and hope that somehow we would build an audience. Uh, what the internet can ostensibly do now is if your band's on the way to Telluride, we could actually, or Roanoke, we could actually let fans know before Rono, you're... tell your eye, they're often compared to <laughs> music centers. <laughs> Great skiing. Um, uh, you, uh, we could let people know before you arrived, before the band arrived, oh, this band's coming to town. We know you like them, or you like a band that sounds like them. They're playing downtown at such and such a club. Here's a ticket. Um, and so there's this sort of infrastructure that's being put together that I think has all sorts of opportunities to harvest. And, and, and we like to think at Pandora about building a musician's middle class, you know, which is um, sort of a thousands, I don't know how many, of musicians who historically have kind of not been able to participate. You know, it's been a feast or famine business, music has, uh, and bring them back, sort of make their, make their careers kind of a middle class career. So 
You know, when you graduate college, like I did, and tell your parents you want to be in a rock band, instead of being horrified, you know, they can think, you know, son, that's a good middle class life you're going into. Uh, that's kind of the vision that we have for Pandora. Someday we could do that. And so I think there's lots of potential as you connect and you have this dialogue and know about people's preferences to sort of support business models. My kids are already grown up, so I'm not going to get that question, but uh, <laughs> I could get to respond that way. But uh, let me ask you about uh, going back to uh, some of the problems that you have to deal with. You have this incredibly, how many different uh, artists do you have on Pandora? Over 90,000. 90,000 artists uh, and uh, millions, obviously, of uh, recordings. What do you have to do to make the mechanics of that work? Yeah, so there are different sort of dimensions to Pandora. The first one is literally the music analysis. So if you came to Pandora, one thing you'd see is a, a group of musicians with headphones on. Uh, they come in every day and there's a big stack of CDs on a to-be-analyzed pile. And they take a CD and sit down and log into our little template, listen to the song and begin literally scoring that song attribute by attribute hundreds of attributes per song to collect its kind of musical DNA. The, the idea is that if you were a musician, you could lay out these you know, 10 sheets of paper with 450 attributes and hear the song in your head. So really understand it in a very detailed form. That analysis then gets added to the collection. And then the next day it starts playing on playlists that's where the algorithm comes into play. So there's a piece of math, essentially, that looks at that song and then will calculate its proximity to other songs in our collection. So if you happen to launch a station with a song that sounds like that, it'll match it up and it'll play it. So that's how we build playlists. We, we sequence songs based on musical relationships. And as you thumb songs up and down, we refine that understanding of your taste. So we're trying to look for patterns. and, and it's, I was a film composer for a while, so my job was to figure out the taste of a film director. And, and we used to sit down together, and I'd bring a stack of CDs, and I'd play music for them and ask them what they liked it, what they liked about it, and sort of glean their taste from it, kind of like a musical Myers-Briggs test. And, <laughs> and that's what Pandora's trying to do. So there's an enormous amount of sort of technology, algorithmic work in there, and sort of data harvesting, because you're really, you're trying to sort of not only understand you know, for you, Congressman, your stations, what your thumbs mean and how to curate them for you, but then for everybody who listens to that kind of music, what are their thumbs collectively saying? How can we help that inform sort of the whole listening experience? So there's that, and there's a whole other layer, which of course is sort of the distribution piece, which is building apps for mobile phones, helping car companies develop embedded technology. There are connected flat screen TVs, Blu-ray players, set-top boxes. Um, there are, there's even a refrigerator now from Samsung that plays Pandora. So we have an army of engineers that work on sort of deploying this everywhere you can imagine you'd listen to radio. So for me to get the music that I want, and I'm, I'm telling you because I, I do use those thumbs and say I like that one, I don't like that one. Um, You've, you've got to get all those artists in line and all that music in line. What is the mechanics of getting those rights to put them on Pandora? Right. Uh, so we fortunately operate under a statutory license, the, the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the great beauty of which is we go to one place, we sign essentially one piece of paper, and it gives us the right to play anything that has been made available for commercial sale in the U.S. And our opinion is that that is absolutely vital to uh, building the future of the industry. You need to simplify and centralize licensing. And Pandora is not available outside the U.S. And the simple reason is there's no analogous licensing arrangement anywhere else in the world. Some, some countries are kind of wrestling with it and have organizations that are kind of trying to figure it out, but the U.S. is actually quite far advanced in terms of facilitating licensing. That's what makes it possible for us because absent a statutory license, we'd have to negotiate 90,000 individual deals and renew them every year or two. And that would just be hugely cumbersome for, you know, for the business. And I think, to be honest, it's really slowed the growth of web radio. So for this new middle class of musical artists, mm -hmm. 
they have uh, a guaranteed stream of compensation for the works that are played on your station. And you get a simplified process for which uh, you're able to, to do that. What, um, what do they need in terms of the certainty that they can enforce their rights, whether online or in the physical world, domestically, overseas? Um, where, where are they in, in, in that realm? In order for them to, to be successful as an artist, they could, with the kind of advanced communications you talk about, mm -hmm. let people know they're coming there, they can play there, mm -hmm. make more money off of a live performance than they would uh, perhaps historically. But uh, also they want to generate some income off of what's played online and in other formats. Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, in terms of retail, I think it's, you can't sugarcoat what's happening in music retail. It's in trouble right now. I think right. everybody knows that. And the principal uh, reason is that purchasing has gone from buying 12 or 15 songs together on a CD to a single. Of which you only wanted one, but you had to pay 15 yeah. bucks to get the one. Except for Sgt. Peppers and, you know, all those right. ones. Um, gotcha. So, so uh, you're going from spending 15 to 20 dollars to 99 cents. Doesn't take a math whiz to know that that's not good news. And, um, and so I think that's a reality that musicians are confronting. You know, each, each year that goes by, you see more and more downward pressure and, and, and you look at the sales figures for the number one album and they pale in comparison to what they were, you know, one, two, three, four, five years ago. Um, so I think that uh, musicians will re respond to that in different ways. Some, I think, will really try to figure out a way to maintain a retail um, presence. Um, but I also think you're going to find musicians trying to build essentially uh, a base of patrons. One, one argument I would make is that in a world where you can easily steal music, um, and I think that it's going to be hard to put that genie back in the box, you need to give, you need to, to essentially enlist the support of people who want to see you continue making music. And essentially, it's kind of going back to the very beginning of music when you were commissioned by the king. Now, you can be commissioned by your 10,000, 100,000, 200,000 fans that say, well, we want you to keep making music and playing shows, coming to our town so we can hear you live. We are going to participate as patrons in your, in your career. And so this communication piece, I think, is absolutely vital. You know, the ability to actually reach out and kind of put your arms around your audience and say, we're going to give to you, please help subsidize us. I think you're gonna see a lot more of that, especially from working musicians. And, and they'll take advantage of anything that they can. Um, Pandora will do all of this you know, naturally. We're gonna support that, but I think musicians will begin to view the relationship with fans a little differently than they have in the past. They already are. Thank you. Let's open it up to questions. They already all listen, so they're all satisfied with exactly what you do. Jerry? What is the range of compensation um, for musicians now? I mean, at the low end and the high end uh, from Pandora. I mean, do, do they just and do they just suddenly get a check in the mail? I mean, if I if I hit it, I, I'm going to get a check for two cents or ninety nine cents. Yeah, I, yeah. So, could everybody hear that question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the way that the mechanics of the license payments is that we write a check every month to a company called Sound Exchange, which is the Performance Rights Society for performance royalties. They bundle all this money together, and I think it's quarterly. They turn around and write checks to artists. I think it's quarterly. They have a minimum amount to cut a check. I'm not sure what that. I think it might be ten dollars. Um, but there are ten dollar checks coming from Pandora. But I think there are artists that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars. I know that from Pandora. Maybe up towards a million even in a, in a single year. Um, so it can be substantial. And I think what's interesting about Pandora is that um, the, the curve of payments, which historically has been really steep, so a very small number of artists get the, you know, the vast majority of payments, our, our tail is fatter. So more artists are making more. It's not quite as concentrated as it was historically. But right now, we're, you know, I think the last figure we put out there was we were about 4.5% of all of radio listening in the US right now. Our intention is to be a much larger share than that. And I think as we get to be a bigger share, all the numbers that we're delivering now 
go, grow in multiples. And then I think it's gonna be real money for a lot of people. And the checks just come in the mail. And it's, you know, it's, it's net. Hi, um, can you explain your uh, privacy policies and what kind of tracking you do of your listeners? Um, do you only track them as they thumb up or thumb down songs, or do you place cookies on that track other activities outside of their P Pandora experience, and do you sell users' information outside of Pandora? Yeah, sure. So, might so wanna, might want to repeat the question. It's, it's a little hard here. So the, the, the question was essentially our privacy policy at Pandora. How do we handle user data uh, uh, on Pandora? So when you register, you give us uh, uh, four pieces of information, your uh, age, uh, gender, uh, zip code, or then a kind of music you listen to. Um, that information is used and only used to um, help your, make your stations better, uh, to communicate with you and to target advertising. So an advertiser on Pandora can go on and say they'd like to deliver their advertisements to only men or women or of a certain age range. It's a really important dimension to, to building a valuable advertising platform. We never sell the data to anybody else. We keep it locked tight at Pandora. We don't track you outside Pandora. It's, we're pretty religious about, about what we do with data. Steve DelBianco with NetChoice. Tim, you opened your uh, uh, discussion with Congressman Goodlatte talking about fairness. You even got the congressman to repeat the word. And at least in this town, when somebody comes to Washington talking about fairness, it opens, well, it opens a Pandora's box of, <laughs> of controversy. Same on it's, you. it's all about fairness. It all depends on where you're coming from. And, and you talked about the 50% share. But over time, does your business model begin to solve your perceived unfairness problem as you bring in more ad revenue? A smaller and smaller share of your gross would have to go for royalties, and you might feel that the market has solved your problem more than the congressman. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. As a, as a share of our revenue, it goes down as we monetize Pandora more efficiently over time. But the, the ceiling for that, or the floor rather, is 25% per the DMCA. So that's the lowest it'll go. And the challenge we have is, is it's, uh, forgive me for using the word fairness again, but we compete with two other forms of radio whose royalty burden is a fraction of ours. And that strikes me as the wrong way to frame a market. I think that to discriminate on one medium or one form of radio because it comes over the web is, is picking winners. Um, and the, what should happen is a much more level playing field. So. You know, we're, we're kind of soldiering through it right now, and you're right that over time it won't be 50%, it'll be a little bit less, but um, still, the, the difference between us and these other forms of radio strike us has, you know, uh, really a, a problem. Who wants the last word? Hey, Chris Pettigrew with the Online Publishers Association. You mentioned that you're looking at you know, getting Pandora out onto different devices, different platforms like the, the refrigerator examples, it's great. What kinds of challenges are you seeing sort of incorporating your content or streaming your content out to those devices? What kinds of challenges have you faced uh, in doing that, either legal or just design challenges? Um, the the, the, the uh, distribution has actually by and large been a pretty um, smooth uh, ride for us so far. I think the principal hurdle is that you know, people only buy cars every seven years. Um, so it takes a while for the fleet to turn over and to have this new generation of cars come in that have these completely embedded uh, versions of Pandora. I mean, there, there's a version of Pandora that operates on Ford's Sync platform that's voice activated. So you can get in the car and you can say, launch my Dave Matthews station and music starts playing. You can thumb that song down, thumb that song up, um, and it's, you know, it's pretty elegant, but people have to have those cars and they have to buy them. So that's the, that's the sort of, uh, it slows us down. In fact, you know, I, I, um, I share a car with my wife, so I don't have a car, basically. And <laughs> I, I, I hadn't actually, Pandora was out on smartphones and was, was being used in cars for about a year before I actually got in a car and used it. And I'd heard all about the experience and, and, and how fun it was, and, and I still remember the first time I used it in a car. I, I, uh, I had a little iPhone, and I, I launched my station, I think it was Nora Jones or something, plugged it into my car dashboard, and then went driving down the highway, and uh, 
15 or 20 minutes later, I was driving, just thinking to myself, you know, gosh, this radio station is just nailing it for me. You know? It's like it knows who I am or something. Because you know? I had forgotten that I was listening to Pandora. I thought I was listening to broadcast radio. And, and I had this series of songs playing that were as if I had picked them myself. And it was a real epiphany for me that I had been accustomed to a very different experience and been captive to, you know, an experience where essentially my hand's on the seek button. And I'm actually a fan of broadcast radio. I've listened to it all my life. I, you know, I'm a, a big pop music junkie. Um, but to be in that environment and suddenly have this personalized experience that's going with me mobily was just a really profound moment. And I think that you know, a few years from now, we'll look back and, and say, wow, radio used to be like that? No, man, I, get, I have my own radio now. I can take it when I go jogging. I can drive with it. It wakes me up in the morning with my alarm clock. It's around me. And I think that's good news for a lot of, a lot of parts of the industry. Well, Tim, thank you. This has been uh, uh, very entertaining and informative. And we wish you great success with Pandora. And I will continue to be a great fan and supporter. Thank you. And I know Thank a lot you. of these folks are too.